Hey all you people, what's going on? We are back with another review slash reliability analysis video. This time it's on a third generation Toyota RAV4. Is this a good vehicle and how reliable is it in the grand scheme of things? These are some of the questions we'll be answering as we look at the RAV4's design, practicality, and its performance on and off road. And then we'll dive headfirst into the reliability of the RAV4 and its major problem areas. And if you're new to this channel, welcome. I don't post very often, but when I do, I make sure it's on a car that I know very well. I know the history of the car and I make sure I do my research before putting anything out online. So sit back, grab a snack, and let's get nerdy. So at this point, at the turn of 2024, the newest third gen RAV4s are pushing 12 to 13 years old. This example, a 2009 base model RAV4, cost us about $8,000 last year with 140,000 miles on the odometer. And in my opinion, this price point puts the RAV4 right in the sweet spot for a used Toyota. It's on the cheaper side, yet still reliable enough to be used as a daily driver. Although it's not quite that cut and dry, stick around and I'll tell you why. Now, objectively, this is my second favorite looking generation RAV4, aside from the fifth generation, which I think looks a little more handsome and chiseled. Here are my favorite things about the styling of this RAV4. I like the cute yet rugged front end, more specifically on the later facelifted models. I love the carryover of the rear mounted spare tire. I also really like the proportions of the vehicle as a whole, but there's a few things I'm not too crazy about with styling. The rather bland side profile leaves something to be desired. The steel wheels on the base model start to rust with age and the plastic wheel covers look super cheap. The headlights look a little like a crazy person showing the whites in their eyes. And I think the nose on the pre-facelift model looks a little wimpy. We like to see strong, prominent noses and we should really embrace them with open arms. As for the interior, it's kind of a mixed bag in here. For 2009, it was totally fine. There's certainly things in here that I can appreciate, like the large climate control dials and the unobstructed visibility, but for the rest of it, it hasn't really aged that gracefully. There's a ton of hard plastics and the whole cockpit kind of feels bulbous. The armrests, at least in the base model, are very thinly padded and the orange backlit gauge clusters seem pretty retro at this point. From the driver's seat, visibility all around is great, but these seats are a bit oddly shaped. Or I'm a little oddly shaped, I'm gonna have to ask my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> this is a six weight manually adjustable seat. No lumbar support on the base level. They don't offer a lot of support for taller people and they're thinly padded. So on longer trips, they can get kind of tiresome. As far as technology goes on the base model, there's an ambient air temp sensor and a fuel economy gauge. That's about it. On the higher trim levels, although it offered Bluetooth, the infotainment center was essentially just like a pixelated screen with limited functionality. So because of that, it's pretty popular to see aftermarket head units in these. Now in the back seat, there's plenty of room in here for two full-size adults or two car seats. But if you were to have a fifth person, it would get a little tight. These seats are pretty comfortable, although a little bit low to the floor, but the floor is nice and flat. I do like that you can recline these seats a fair bit. <sighs> Plus there's two cup holders in the door and two in the center folding armrest. Now, unfortunately, at least on this trim level, there's no HVAC vents back here. And if you were to reach for the seat belt for the middle seat, it's located in the roof in the back, which isn't very practical, but as a whole, for practicality's sake, the RAV4 has a lot to offer. Now, this is the main reason why people would buy a RAV4 in the first place, because they can fit a lot of stuff in the back, and so far, that's my favorite thing about owning one. The rear-mounted spare tire, which, although a little controversial, and I got rid of it in later models, I really like it because that allows the loading surface to be lower to the ground, and it also gives you a lot of vertical room here. Plus, if you open this up, there's a big cargo space down here. So just a super usable cargo area. And pull these, the seats fold completely flat. Does this bring us to the most important part of the video? You know what, it does. This brings us to the most important part of the video. Does it sleep in any car guy, the standard unit of measurement? I do this in case anyone who owns one of these or is in the market wants to potentially sleep in the back, do some overlanding, some camping. Now let's check it out. I'm six feet tall. <laughs> so my head's touching, my feet are kind of hanging out. All right, now let's try it. Thank you, Samantha. Feet are in. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh that's perfect. Can camp in this no problem. Good. Now, speaking of overlanding and potentially camping in the back of this, how does the RAV4 perform off-road? I know only a fraction of these are ever going to see serious off-road use. You might be interested to know that they do hold their own on the easier trails. 
After all, this does sport the four-wheel drive badge on the back. I compared their off-road ability to that of a well-equipped Subaru Forester. The all-wheel drive system is front-wheel biased. That means it only sends power to the rear wheels when the computer in the car thinks that it's necessary. But what Toyota did is they included a center lock and differential option. And what that does is it allows the engine to send torque to the front and rear wheels at an even rate. That 50-50 split makes this thing four-wheel drive. The center locking diff coupled with the ability to turn traction control off really gives you a little bit more off-road ability. Now, I did take this thing on some easier trails. Um, and it did surprisingly well. I did get stuck once and it kind of broke through the ice when I was filming the Xterra off-roading. Good. But we did a little bit more mild off-roading um, and it really showed me like the limiting factors of this when it comes to off-roading. bottoming out. The two biggest limiting factors when it comes to off-roading are the lack of low-range gearing and the relatively low ground clearance. But overall though, if you're looking to do some light-duty off-roading, the RAV4 can be a good option. Okay, so how does this thing drive? Now, RAV4s have always been about blending the driving experience of a car with the versatility of an SUV. And uh, that's exactly what this thing does. The suspension is a bit firm, although ours is in need of a suspension update. Road noise by modern standards is not that great, but when this came out, I'd say it was right around the middle of the pack. The handling is fairly nimble and it certainly feels more like a car than an SUV. Cliche corner. <laughs> so we are in the four cylinder variant, but I'm still curious to see what this does zero to 60. Let's go for it. I would turn traction control off, but it's not <laughs> gonna make a damn difference. <laughs> First gear pulls, second gear kind of a dog. All right, that was 60. I'd say that my biggest complaint is the four speed transmission in this. The long gears make it an absolute slug on the highway. Like I said, the V6 on the other hand comes with a five speed automatic. It makes about 90 more horsepower, making it a wildly different driving experience. All while only using marginally more fuel. All right, now for the moment you've all been waiting for, how reliable is the third gen Toyota RAV4? Well, let me just start by prefacing. These are generally considered really reliable vehicles, but there are some models and year ranges to avoid, and every single model of this does have an issue. Some of you may remember the pedal entrapment recall uh, back in 2011, I think. <laughs> this is when the media blew it out of proportion and it affected somewhere around 1.4 million Toyotas, not just RAV4s. Another big recall was for rear tie rod corrosion. This affected about 780,000 vehicles. And what would happen is uh, when you go to get your car aligned, you know, if they don't tighten the nut properly, uh, the threads could possibly strip out on those rear tie rods. And that would lead to an abrupt change in rear end alignment, potentially causing crashes. Another recall was the driver's side airbag between around 06 and 08. There was the potential for the airbag to not go off in the case of a, an accident. Um, this was due to the wiring. And in conjunction with that, about 1.1 million Toyotas were recalled due to the fact that their seat belt could get cut on the seat frame. So there would be no seat belt to stop someone from flying into the non-functioning airbag. Another recall would be uh, the power window master switch getting water inside, potentially shorting out and causing a fire. Okay, recalls aside, let's talk about other issues that I found personally and common issues that I've seen online. I'll start with the smaller issues then work my way up to the severe ones. So typically when cars age, the suspension wears out. That's just inevitable with any car. But a lot of RAV4s had issues with the rear suspension. Many people reported the rear shocks leaking oil. That's definitely the case with ours right now. It's super loud when you go over bumps and uneven surfaces, and it rides pretty harsh. Another really common issue, and this one actually has a technical service bulletin for it, is the rear sway bar end links either stripping out or shearing off. I've actually had to replace both of them since owning this. 
Another slightly smaller issue is the steering shaft. Uh, so the steering shaft has a U-joint, and oftentimes, if that goes bad, the steering can feel like it's binding up, and you're gonna get weird noises coming from that. Again, not a huge issue, but that's not typically something that's supposed to happen with age. All right, let's get to the slightly larger issues. This goes for pretty much all RAV4s with the four-wheel drive. There's a rear differential coupling that can go bad. And this is where the drive shaft meets with the rear differential. Uh, there's a little bearing here that can get contaminated, causing the bearing to go bad early. And this is not a cheap fix. This part is really expensive. Toyota recognized this as an issue, uh, so they put out a technical service bulletin for it. We're actually having that issue right now with this. It sounds kind of like a bad wheel bearing. As far as V6 specific problems go, uh, generally the V6 is going to be more reliable than the four cylinder, but it does still have a couple issues. One of them being, and this isn't very widespread, but the water pump can fail. And when that happens, it typically leaks fluid and the little bearing on the inside that the impeller sits in will degrade, start making noise. And you don't want that to fail because that probably means your engine's going to overheat. And another thing, uh, as far as the EVAP systems go, there's a, a charcoal canister that filters the excess pressure coming out of the fuel tank. Um, sometimes these can fail so that you can get clogged up. And when that happens, you'll notice when you go to fill up the tank, the gas pump will stop pumping even though the tank's not full. So if that's happening to you, it might be that charcoal canister starting to go. Another issue that's V6 specific uh, is the oil line kind of getting old, brittle, and starting to leak that goes to the variable valve timing actuator. So this will cause your engine to run pretty rough. It'll also cause a loss in oil pressure and a big mess. One more issue with the V6. Um, for some reason, the exhaust in the V6 tends to rot out more often than the four cylinder. But man, after having two Toyotas with the four cylinder, I can very confidently say that they're more problematic than the V6. Here's a couple issues that are only specific to the four cylinder. When the third gen RAV4 came out in 05, 06, the base power plant was the four cylinder 2AZ FE engine. And then around 2009, they switched to the 2A RFE, which is a little less problematic. The best way to tell the difference between the two is that the 2AZ FE is a 2.4 liter displacement and the 2A RFE is a 2.5. With the 2.4 liter engine, there is a common issue. Now this doesn't happen to every single one, but it happens common enough where I should mention it. It actually happened to our Camry that had the 2.4. This engine is prone to having the head bolts actually strip out of the block. And this will give you symptoms very similar to a blown head gasket because you're not going to have a proper seal between the head and the block of the engine. The three most common symptoms are your engine overheating, very dirty coolant, and smoke coming out of your exhaust. When this happened to our Camry, we actually went in and used a time cert kit to bore out and re-thread the cylinder head. It was a big job, so you don't want this to happen to you. Another huge issue with the four cylinders is oil consumption. The thing to look out for here is a low oil level as well as blue smoke coming out of the exhaust. Now this comes down to premature wear on the piston rings or faulty piston rings. And this was such a common issue that Toyota actually warranted this. The fix for this was to give the customer a new short block. So essentially a whole new engine. And finally, another issue that I found to be very widespread is the variable valve timing sprocket that goes bad. I believe this affects most of the 2.5 liters up until about 2012. I'm not gonna go into how this whole mechanism works. Uh, I'll actually leave a link in the description below that shows how they fail. Just know that it's kind of a pain in the butt to change. And although some people say you can drive a long time with these bad, if this happens to you, I do recommend getting it fixed as soon as you can. All right, so that's about it for notable issues. And like I said, although these are considered to be reliable vehicles, I was kind of surprised once I started digging and I actually had one for myself, how many issues can arise, especially with the four cylinder variant. So if you were in the market for a third gen RAV4, I would recommend getting one either with the V6 or if you're looking at the four cylinder for budget or fuel economy purposes, I would recommend going 2009 to 2012 because they seem to have less major issues. All right, so thank you guys so much for watching. If any of you have any personal experience with RAV4s, please feel free to share it in the comments below. Anyhow, I hope this video helps you out. I know I don't post often, but when I do, I like to make it worth it. So thank you guys again, and until next time, take care now, bye-bye then. I'm really glad I folded this down because my pry bar is in here. The whole cockpit kind of feels bulbous. You're bulbous. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> and what?
Whoa, I've never opened those cubbies since I had this. <laughs> no way. 